Well, hey, here we are at the Banjo Workshop in Winterhawk. I'm happy to be here today to moderate the discussion. And everybody sitting down behind you will be able to see. Bela Fleck and Scott Best over here. Indeed, representing the avant garde in the banjo technique. And gee, we're hoping that Rob McCurdy. May uh, show up, but uh, I haven't seen their bus up here, so maybe they're just a little bit late. Uh, I usually tune up to my uh, Black Jones records, but today. <laughs> 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 Well, any questions so far? I'm sure everybody wants to know what kind of picks they listen to. Of course, I mean, aren't those the questions that people ask for? Uh, but my, mainly, uh, I think we're here... How many people want to know how much stuff I've stolen from Bill Keith? <laughs> yeah. I think you know. <laughs> Well, you know, this is folk music. We all borrow from everybody. And, you know, uh, I'm, I think it's great that, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the influences can run both ways. Uh, just because, I mean, uh, when I was getting started, Baylor wasn't around to listen to. But now that he is, there's uh, every reason in the world where, uh, that I can listen and learn to. And it's great that uh, the influences can run both ways. And uh, uh, so uh, it's not simply chronological here. I happen to be the oldest guy out here, but uh, let's stop here. <laughs> I ain't taken by anger yet. <laughs> well, I am. Uh, <laughs> are you taking chromium to colonate too? <laughs> I might stop taking that stuff. Bill, can you bring Jim with you? Yeah. <laughs> well, let's see. Uh, we could we take a, take a simple tune and then show uh, how it might have evolved uh, playing wise through uh, uh, various time zones. Uh, what uh, what's with genetic engineering? <laughs>
Taylor Sack and Scott Castle. Bill Keith. on the road a lot, uh, I mean, for the last few years. Uh, we're uh, glad you rolled in just scant uh, minutes before. Uh, you heard me What's up? Oh, it's been fine out there, you know. Uh, <laughs> if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> um, actually, um, we'd like to play a little tune now. Uh, uh, in the musician parlance, this is a uh, a one five one one four five one <laughs> Something like that. Want to want to sing, Bela? Happy birthday! Yeah. A few days ago, it's a big boy now. <laughs> Let's see, uh, Trigger. Uh, <laughs> just turned forty. Well, thank you for that uh, rousing um, <laughs> tribute to aging. Well, let's play another tune until to, to we figure out what we're going to talk about. <laughs> Okay, we'll try a little Salt Creek in the key of G this time.
thanks very much. How could she sleep through this? <laughs> so liminal. Well, Scott, uh, you've been out there traveling a lot too with David and uh, Continental Divide. In fact, I ran into you over at the great festival over in Eastern Connecticut, uh, Strawberry Park Festival. Mm -hmm. and the band sounded great. Thank you. And uh, it's the first time I heard you sing a solo. Uh, <laughs> in fact, it was the encore. Heck of a way to leave the crowd wanting more. They <laughs> <laughs> won't let me do it any sooner. <laughs> Would you pick us one? Tell us something about it. Oh, gosh. Uh, let's see. I've got one here that I uh, just started kind of working on. I really don't have a lot of it put together. It's kind of in the beginning stages. It's just kind of a, I think it's kind of a pretty melody. And uh, I'll try to play this with Part of it's six eight, and then it goes to a four four on the B part. Notice when you had your melody on the first string, you're rolling with the backward roll, and when it went to the inside, you use a four roll. I find that interesting. <laughs> I'm glad you told me. I didn't know that. <laughs> I can see it from here. <laughs> I had an interesting observation, which is you use more repeated uh, middle fingers than most people I've seen. Hmm. Multiple middles. Uh, <laughs> uh, matter of fact, they were, uh, I remember in, in a workshop I attended that you did. You were telling about how you you have a you alternate. You're conscious of always alternating the uh, thumb and index. Uh, even when the melody starts on the offbeat, you start on the offbeat finger in that case. So that. Yeah, when I'm, when I'm doing single string stuff, how many banjo players are out there, by the way? How many people are just hanging out? Banjo enthusiasts. Well, it's, with the single string stuff, the way I do it, um, I usually make the downbeats thumbs and the upbeats indexes. So as if you were playing down with a flat pick and up with a flat pick. It's like down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. So if, uh, if you're playing a... It's just thumb in the thumb in the thumb in the thumb in the Like that. But if you were to leave out the first note and you were like... One, I'd start with the index and make believe that thumb didn't hit. Because otherwise, rhythmically, I would feel upside down. 
<laughs> but that's just the way I do it, and I've realized um, that uh, it's not the only way to do it. I used to think that was the only way to be solid doing it, but now I'm hearing a lot of people who turn it around and, and use whatever finger comes up next, and that's valid too. But for me, it, it felt like a way to get solid, is just to have that consistent at least. I was trying to figure out when you were doing your single string stuff. I'm not sure if you start with your thumb or not. I uh, pretty much on the same way. Yeah, mm -hmm. unless it feels kind of awkward. Unless it's a, a certain lick that requires right. you to start with that. Right. Yeah. And then it gets complicated if you move into like uh, triplets and stuff like that, because um, if you do one triplet, um, you're going to end up backwards. So like if you're going uh, like that, just one tri triplet and keep the line going. Um, now I'm on my index on the downbeat, so, so that's that's um, where you decide either to double up, um, you know, and you stick a thumb, use the thumb, thumb twice, which I, I, I don't do, I'll just wait, maybe leave a space, and that, that's one way around, but if you do two sets of triplets, then there's no problem because you end up back on a, a down, does this make sense? So like... so forth and you figure out ways to get get through it. More than you wanted to know about single string. Uh, well, double, well, one thing we rarely do as banjo players in any style is hit the same string twice in a row with the same finger. In blue in bluegrass, in the Keith style, melodic style, in single string. That's what gives it, I don't know, something. But on mandolin, for instance, Monroe would go you know, all downstrokes, which I just did all with my thumb, and um, it, why not? You know, if it's slow enough to do it, it's, it's, it creates another intensity, like Wes Montgomery always played with his thumb, always downstrokes, and he got really, really fast at it. So all of these rules that we set in place, you know, are always debatable, and you know that if I was to say, you can't play this fast using your just your thumb. Some guy, you know, some 14-year-old kid is going to come out from back here and say, "Hey, watch this!" No, <laughs> do it. So, <laughs> but sometimes you can use the rules kind of as guidelines and just keep them as you know as rules that are like um, you know use them use them when they help you and don't use them when they hold you back. Because um, there's a lot of reasons why the different rules are in place. Because a lot of people try and figure out how to do something and then you know people settle on a way to teach it or a way to express it, but and, and those are really helpful for people who come after to, you know, to understand different aspects of, you know, banjo playing or life or whatever. But uh, you always have to be prepared to um, bust out of those cages because they can become cages. So. Sometimes those rules come after the fact. In other words, after a lot of people played something, somebody can look over and say, well, they never use a finger twice in a row, so there must be a rule against that. Right. When in fact nobody really ever thought about it. Or, uh, <laughs> uh, no, it's you know, things yeah. happen like that, or people imagine that there are limitations, and then somebody comes along and breaks through them. So that's what progress is. <laughs> yeah, there's a question over there. No, I mean, you know, really don't have time to think at any at any point in life. <laughs> no, but I mean, the thing is, at the point where we're all playing on stage, I mean, a lot of this stuff is pretty like, um, like when we're, when we're talking now, and you're not thinking, okay, now what word comes after I like the banjo? You know, you, you, you can just talk, you know? So, uh, so whether you're speaking, uh, uh, you know, ancient Arabic, or whether you're speaking, you know, English, or or whatever, you learn these different languages. So your language might be Scruggs style, for instance. So you have a, a repertoire of, uh, of ability uh, expressing yourself in Scruggs style, um, playing what needs to be played, and you might not have to plan any of it. You just know Scruggs style, so you can play a song you might have never heard before. You just set out and play it, and we've all had that experience of being in a jam session on stage, and suddenly it's your break, and you've never heard the song before, and you do something, and it all works out fine. But, uh, but there's all these different musical languages, whether, whether um, whether it's, like I said, the Keith style, um, there's a whole se series of things you can learn when you get really adept at that to where you can react pretty spontaneously. And, uh, and the same thing with single string and all the styles that haven't come yet. And so forth. This hop is sweaty. What do you, 
change your playing in any way with using your left hand and your right hand? You just learn how to adopt to it, or what, what do you do when your hands are this When it's this hot and sweaty, what do we what do we do differently? We don't dance around quite as much. <laughs> I think uh, it's easier when it's hot and sweaty than it is when it's real cold. <laughs> then uh, that slows things down considerably. Uh, I'd rather play when it's hot. Got it. Thoughts on playing in three, four time, all time, that kind of Thoughts on three, four time. Well, we just heard a little bit of uh, three, four, Vestaling. What do you think? Uh, I really don't don't have a something thought out, you know, that I would do. I mean, you, uh, you just think about the time. Let me just make a remark about the three four time before uh, we get into the more complicated time signatures. Uh, but uh, you know, a very large percentage of the bluegrass style stuff is in uh, two four time, and and uh, if you if you get real used to playing in that, it it comes as sort of a shock when uh, you have to play in 3-4, and it seems like you're constantly trying to cram those rolls in there or edit them, uh, take out extra notes, or somehow make it uh, make it fit. And uh, um, I think to do, just for anything to come naturally, you just have to do it most of the time. And the more you play 3-4 style or 3-4 time uh, tunes, the more ideas you'll have for them. Uh, it's just that in the repertoire stuff that I play, I don't run across them all that much. So it's still, you know, I have to think harder as I play the three, four stuff. One thought might be that uh, we have three fingers, so forward rolls and backward rolls are going to be really natural. So if you're playing, uh, that's all backward. Or forward. idea and then you can start picking the melody out you have to adjust the rolls and stuff like that was it that's a scrubs uh, well, I didn't play it exactly like him but that that's a playing three four and scrub style one of the few the few uh, scrubs things in three, which he did great. I was asking about seven. That's um. Someone else is holding it down for you. <laughs> Starting to do, but, huh. but uh, there's all kinds of time signatures. We do a tune in 11, which is a really hard. <laughs> Don't you feel that, I mean, that kind of rhythm is um, in some ways kind of a mind uh, game and you can't physically engage that rhythm and tap your foot and swing. Well, that's for us, yes. But if you take like the Bulgarians who grew up with it, they just think what, whatever it is, short, short, and fast, short, short, and fast, and they dance to it. And it's, they do it from when they're little kids. So why should that be so hard for us? You know, so it's like, here's a real natural way to play seven. He 
see it starts to not seem so strange. Then you imagine. <laughs> okay, give me another hour. <laughs> but they, I mean, people do, you know, it's what you grow up with. I, I, yeah, I didn't grow up over there. But uh, <laughs> I, 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 I love to hear it. I think it's great that the banjo is, you know, that you're doing these things on the banjo and showing uh, new uh, or defining some new boundaries out there. But I, 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 I maintain that rhythmically it's just not as organic as uh, these two, four, three, four. And, uh, around the world, I mean, there are more dance rhythm, dances in, in, in uh, duple or triple time than there ever could be in 11. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you want to look at it that way. <laughs> Yeah, we all. Yeah, we all. Do. We all do. Yeah. you want to do something in uh, some different tune? Not one. Yeah, about five months less, six months less. Still one tuning, the same tuning. Different tunings, the same. Not a lot. Once I get G tuning, I like to kind of stay there. <laughs> it's hard enough for me to get in. Yeah, minor adjustments are one thing. Well, you know, you do build your reflexes uh, if you're in it, use a tuning uh, a lot, then certain things become automatic. As soon as you're in another tuning, everything, it has, you have to go back to square one, or you learn a tune by rote, and you'll play it the same way every time, and maybe get better at that way of doing it, but to really get, you know, to step out and play what you're thinking at the moment, I think you need to depend on your reflexes, which you build as you uh, get experience in one tuning. So uh, in some ways, uh, I, as Scott says, I feel a lot more at home in the G2 than just because that's where I spend most of my time. But like, as in the 2-4 time It's good to write in though. It's but, really good to write in different tunings to throw it, throw it different to, you know, because you don't know your way around. And writing is different than improvising, so sometimes... If you put uh, throw a string into a different place, and suddenly you don't know your way, you're forced to find things that sound good to your ear. Which is, um, and there's no pressure of like if there's an audience in front of you. You're just at your house or something. And so I, I, I definitely use tunings as a as a uh, a compositional, um, inspirational thing. Just example. Yeah, like the other day. I, Thing, um, the second string up to C and the third string up to D flat. And yielded some of this kind of stuff. Uh, different sound. Yeah. And a lot of that stuff you wouldn't really be able to play in the regular key without stretching your fingers all different ways and a lot of it would be, you just couldn't do it. But this way it's just as easy as uh, a scrug style natural type thing. And then the harmonics it gives you. I mean. So as a compositional thing, and that, that's a tune on the new Flectones record, so it ended up being a song and everything. But I wouldn't know how to get around that tune. I mean, I just played everything I know in that tuning just now. That's it. And, uh, <laughs> you know what? You know, I don't. I don't quite know where these two middle strings are. I mean, they're just the Netherlands. So, which which is part of what made the tune come out that way. What do you do uh, with the key of E? You don't necessarily have to do anything, but just maybe say what kind of stuff you do with your. 
shooting or capo or Somebody said John Hartford. John Hartford tunes his whole banjo down to E a lot, which is a wonderful sound, really great sound. But there's uh, what basically what three, three or four. There's four. I can think of four ways to handle E offhand. One is out of the open position. Uh, one is with the cable with the second fret playing out of the D kind of position. Uh, one is with the cable with the fourth fret playing out of the C position, and one's with the cable at the ninth fret. But, I mean, really, that's just four I ideas. Probably those would be the most obvious ones. Tony Trishka does a lot of stuff in open E where he just plays it. Ruben kind of works. And it gives you the open G, which is a blue, a blue note. It's kind of fun to play in weird keys, and uh, weird keys, he's not a weird key if you talk to a bass player or a guitar player or anybody else, but for, for us, and see how the, the, the band of strings that are not in that chord, the, how the open strings relate to it in a strange way, like that. that. That's kind of neat. What's neat about playing an open E is you've got, you've got this neat G string to deal with. And then you've got open D too, so you could do this. And every key has its own. Every key that's every key has its open strings that are cool. <laughs> if you're in G sharp. You use all the G notes. It's it pretty weird. Well, uh, gee, uh, I took some piano lessons when I was a kid, and uh, after a few years, uh, uh, failing to sort of connect with the instrument, uh, I decided. I heard the, on the radio one night. I heard a banjo, and so and just said something to me. I just decided uh, to take up the instrument. So I went to a music store and rented one. And I didn't know the difference. It was a tenor banjo, <laughs> but it was it was a banjo, and I was happy, and I was uh, learning stuff. And then. Uh, I heard a plectrum, and I like the sound of that more, so I retuned and got into that. And then a few years later, I heard a five-string banjo, and I said, wait a minute, that's what it is all this time that I've been thinking about. So that's when I changed uh, over to five-string banjo. That was in the fall of 1957. <laughs> and I've this thing around ever since. Boy, my arm is not tired. <laughs> Right about the time I was, just about the time my mom and dad got together. To <laughs> yeah, sparks were flying everywhere. <laughs> but, uh, that's uh, that's my side of it. It took me a while to figure out that this is what I wanted to play, uh, and now that I, and when I did. Uh, I haven't changed my mind since. I started, uh, yeah, I'm glad. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I started playing guitar, um, I don't know how old I was, but um, I, my mother played a little bit of campfire guitar. She had been a summer camp counselor up here somewhere. Um, and so she knew Kumbaya and a couple of other things, basically D and A chords and uh, occasionally G and uh, I asked her to sh teach me what she knew and she didn't want to uh, for a while but then finally she saw I was serious and so she got me a, a classical guitar and I started playing that and everybody kept pointing me towards taking guitar lessons and I took them but I 
really didn't really. I knew I liked music, but nothing was happening. It would, just nothing was happening. So, I, but I was progressing a little bit, and I was playing Beatles, Beatles songs and learning the chords out of the Beatles songbooks and stuff. And took a few guitar lessons about you know what the pentatonic scales were on the guitar and stuff from a rock guitar player. And then uh, I got a, I heard the banjo, and um, my grandfather actually bought one at a flea market somewhere around Peekskill, New York, and uh, and brought it. I came up there for the weekend. Uh, this was the the weekend before high school started. I was 15, and uh, here was this banjo, and we took the train up there. I remember um, here was this cool banjo. It was just a K, a funky, you know, cheap five-string banjo, but it was a banjo, and a joke. I, I, I had fallen in love with it recently with the, the movie Deliverance. Had that, that uh, well, it was, you know, we all heard it. It really impacted a lot of people, the dueling banjos and, uh, and the um, Ballad of Jet Clampett. Had, uh, were the two things that I had heard that just really told me where it was at, and uh, it was a very powerful pull. And when I finally got that banjo, luckily enough, as we got on the train from Peekskill back to the city where I grew up, um, there was a guy who was a banjo player. He said, "Hey, is that a banjo?" I said, "Yeah." And he said, "Can I tune it up for you?" And he tuned it up for me and played all the way down on the train back to the city. And he was a pretty good scrug style player. And so it was like now it was in tune, you know. <laughs> From there, I could pretty much handle it on my own. <laughs> then I got the, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, it was just serendipity. Um, and uh, and then, uh, then um, I took lessons from uh, all these great banjo players, starting with a guy named Eric Darling, um, who used to play with the Weavers, who played in a pretty traditional style. And then he said, well, you have to learn the, the Keith style now. I've shown you all I can show you. You have to learn the Keith style. And it sounded like some kind of machine shop or something. I just didn't <laughs> know what he was talking about. And so but I said, okay, do I really have to, you know? And he said, yeah, we really should. So he sent me to this guy named Mark Horowitz, who knew, you know, a remarkable amount of your stuff. Really a lot. And um, I don't know if he showed it to him or he figured it out or he's really got a quick ear and, uh, and started showing me all that stuff. And that was the new horizon for me. And uh, and then he, then I started uh, after studying with Mark for a good year or two, probably. Uh, it got to where all I was asking him was about these Tony Trishka records he had told me about, <laughs> and uh, and Mark got really tired of trying to figure out Tony Trishka's songs by the next lesson to teach me. <laughs> and I don't blame him because I mean there's these there's some hard stuff and very different thinking. So eventually he said, "Here's Tony's number. Stop bothering me." Kid. <laughs> Tony taught, started teaching me, and that was a, also a great, great thing. So that was my story. My, uh, my grandfather played fiddle, and uh, kind of in an old-time country band. And uh, I started playing a little bit of guitar. He showed me uh, a few chords, and he told me if I learned to play uh, three chords, he would buy me a guitar. So I learned some chords and. Uh, he ended up buying me this uh, Fender guitar, and uh, I played around on it. My brother and I sang and played uh, around Texas and Oklahoma, and uh, a fellow in his, the band that my grandfather played in uh, also played some banjo. He played electric guitar, but he played a little banjo, and uh, I, I don't know what it was. I just fell in love with it one day, and uh, he let me play on it, and from then on, I just I had to have one. I just had to, had the bug, and and uh, I finally got one. My dad bought me one. Uh, I was 13, and I would just get in my room and sit and play constantly. My mother would, would uh, most of the time, she'd just about have to threaten to whip me to get me to come eat supper or go to school or anything. So, uh, moms and banjos don't. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but uh, I'll just, I'm just always love the, the sound of the banjo, and uh, I, I grew up more listening to bluegrass and not really knowing any certain direction. I never took any lessons from anyone. I uh, just went to festivals and uh, aggravated people to death in jam sessions. So I guess I did kind of have lessons as far as just getting out and jamming and, and uh, just playing, staying up two or three days, having fun with it. You know, I think that's, that's kind of the main thing for me is uh, if you don't enjoy it, I think, you know, it's kind of wasted time so. 
that's my little story there. <laughs> Enough talk. Yeah. Thanks for requesting tunes that I know. <laughs> really do have melodies. Uh, in fact, when I first heard the five-string banjo, there were so many notes coming along, it was sort of overwhelming. And I said, this, this is too disorganized. What's going on here? And uh, it took me a while to tune my ear and to hear uh, the melodies. In fact, it was easier uh, to relate to a song. Uh, let's say, uh, let the flat was singing where I could hear a melody line and then see how it was interpreted on the banjo. And I still remember uh, uh, in there, <coughs> years ago, going to a uh, Flecktones concert around Christmas time. Actually, the, the show was in Woodstock, where, where I live, and so I didn't have to go very far. But uh, the, uh, uh, I thought the, the most, some of, for me, some of the most interesting tunes he did were the Christmas carols done uh, in, uh, in uh, you know, extended into uh, the style of the, your style and the band style because I knew the melodies there, and I, really I was able to relate a lot better in some ways to those uh, Christmas carols, those known quantities, than uh, to the, uh, the tunes that you were doing, because they were the melodies of those uh, to us for me. Yeah, well, a, lot, a lot of times what we end up doing is is uh, trying to figure out what the melody is out of the banjo roll and, and handing it over to the saxophone or the, or the harmonica or whatever other instrument is out there so that it'll... Um, reinforce that because a lot of times it's hard for people to hear if you're just playing in a row what what is the melody and what's the backup and um, well you know some banjo players are really good at um, bringing notes out of the role you know pulling them out and playing with a lot of dynamics in their role I, I was always I always thought you were supposed to get every note exactly the same volume I thought that was the goal for a long the longest longest time so that might make it even harder with me sometimes to figure out what the melody is because I'm trying to, I'm trying to have it all be but as time goes on, I'm realizing there's a real art in, in presenting that melody and lifting it up out of the room. You know, uh, that brings up the other, the, the subject of syncopation, or how much uh, sort of lilt or bounce you put into your playing. Uh, yeah. Do you have a word about you? You know, I... You bounce pretty hard. I, I, I'm actually... We're talking here about the sort of the timing of pairs of notes I think, and if, if you play evenly as the music is usually written, uh, it's hard to tell where the beat is, and if you take that same thing and uh, interpret it, it maybe written the same way, but you interpret it uh, with uh, some uh, syncopation, aside from the fact that it's out of tune, you can hear that there is now a kind of rhythmic quantity. <laughs> I grew up up north, and I remember everybody talked about. I remember you played with a lot of bounce, and um, and uh, people talked about Alan Shelton being, you know, this great thing. And I checked him out, and he played with a lot of bounce with Jim and Jesse. But then I discovered when I moved to the south that a lot of people were playing with what I would call straight straight time, or less less like dotted eights, mm -hmm. and more like, and that it was like locomoting in a different way. Like maybe they could t like, and sometimes so one guy would be swinging, like bouncing, and one guy wouldn't, and that would create a whole different thing. But it seemed like, um, and I and I listened to some of the hard drive, and like for instance, Ralph Stanley, no bounce whatsoever, but it grooves in a different way. Mm -hmm. So so I started to see that there were just different approaches to time. That just you can have sixteenth notes even, and you can have a 
you know, a sheet of 16th notes where it's all 16ths and two people could approach it completely differently. And for me, that solved one of the mysteries about, well, why does it feel good when we play with some guys, but other guys you play with them, it feels terrible and you can't connect and you know they're good players, you know. And uh, a lot of times it's like agreeing on how much to bounce or how much you bounce naturally and how much they do. Would you buy any of this? I think you, you, you play with a little more straight eights, I think. But yeah, I'll probably fluctuate just right. depending on the, uh, the style of tune it is or song. That's, right. I think that's a good explanation. And as you get, if you become aware of it, you, you can kind of uh, relax your bounce if you're playing with somebody who plays with a real straight time thing and it'll groove differently or bounce more if the music is bouncing. And so I, I, for me, it's, it kind of got like that in my, in my mind. Anyway. I had this one session where there was a Luther Perkins style guitar player doing ta -ta 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 -ta, right. which has no bounce in it. And I was playing at the medium tempo, which is where I feel like that uh, having that, uh, that swing in there. And, uh, and, the, and the, the guy kept, he says, he says, no, 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 play it straight, play it straight. And he kept, uh, uh -huh. I tried my hardest, and it was all I could do to keep that uh, element out of there. It's hard because it's an unconscious part of how, how most of us play, you know, as well. But you can become conscious of it and, and work with it. But in another way, it's a, it's a stamp of your personality, and who you are, what, how much of a bounce you play with so. It's, it's, it's an interesting subtlety of banjo playing, I think. We were going to play something. Here's a little bit of that uh, Fall Creek. Shenandoah Valley Break.
I just really identified that time listening to you two guys that you play very bouncy and you play very straight time and how different and how they how great they both sound and how different they both are. So you got into some pretty advanced kind of um, rhythmic displacement, I would call it. Um, RD. I'm just plain lost. But not, not because you came out and you came out. You, came out. you sat over there on the other end for a little while, and then you and you came out in the right place. So you must have known what was going on. I was hoping. I was hoping. <laughs> You, were doing, you did the same thing in that, well, you were displacing one note within the time. You know? Oh, right, right. Yeah. So, uh, you, you came out of it too. <laughs> hey, can I show you guys? I've got my sitar band. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We've got a real treat here before we have to wind things up. We've got a message that uh, we won't be able to share the space with you too much longer, but Bill has got a sitar banjo uh, here to, uh, to get us into the mood, the hot weather mood. Yeah, this might believe you're in India, but uh, uh, just since uh, I won't, I'm sure I won't be able to play it tonight on the main stage because it's real quiet, I, I just wanted to show it to you, I'll just demonstrate it for you. There's a guy named Rick Kaplan who, uh, who showed up with the first one I had ever seen. He works for... Um, public radio up in Washington, D.C., and he showed up at the Banjo Institute with this idea, which was a sitar bridge on banjo, and uh, and I've refined it a little bit so that um, on his, the banjo itself was pretty dead, but it rattled real good, but on this one, there's a little bit of banjo sound, too, so uh, thanks to Rick Kaplan for this great idea, or maybe you'll hate it. <laughs> Let me see if I'm in tune for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so you can kind of play it like a banjo a little bit. Tuned in a, a kind of a neat tuning. Uh, it's a double C tuning where the low D is tuned down to a C and the B is tuned up to a C. So I'm going to play something. Uh, uh, taste of it because I know we're running out of time and uh, I don't want to there's no sympathetic strings but because you put it in a double C tuning the open strings act as sympathetic strings so if you uh, if you hit for instance uh, here there's a I 
makes that sound is the bridge. You see the bridge. Um, this is, could be on any banjo, by the way, but no one's really making them yet, but um, I'm sure somebody will. But you see the bridge is like two bridges right next to each other, and then there's a table in between them. And the table is on a slant, so the strings are rattling off that table, and that's basically all it is. So. <laughs> Uh, uh, um, stuff to make a, a countertops out of. Um, Corian. Corian. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the, the sitar banjo. Sorry we don't have a lot more time to go into it. Do we have time to do one more thing all together? Yeah, well, let's just do something to close up. Uh, yeah, I played it on the new Black Tones album on one song. So, uh, yeah. Scott has got to go um, to the stage, so if he takes off all of a sudden, we'll all understand. The Scott Vestal. actually a funeral uh, march, one of the happy ones, and uh, it was on one side of the first uh, record that the Scruggs family got when they sent away for their uh, for their Victrola. Uh, it came with a record, and it, that's what was on it, the Farewell Blues. And uh, in there somewhere in the original... Uh, uh, Finish chord, and uh, it got uh, simplified a little for the bluegrass version, and uh, we're all still usually sticking with that. Uh, you know, yeah. we, also, it should be pointed out that Earl Scruggs uh, used the actual uh, flat nine chord on, the, on this when he does that. So Earl Scruggs played that. It's pretty, pretty, pretty out there. <laughs> yeah? So he could be out there too. <laughs>
aplauso. Which reminded me, somebody else recently just turned 40, a great musician. And coming up right now, whether you're a banjo lover or just a music lover, you're sure to be entertained. This is a Winterhawk first, and I know you're going to enjoy it. You can flash your lights and put your hands together, and please make welcome, Bela Fleck and the Fleck Dog. Yeah. Right. 
Thank you very much. I have many announcements to make.
Bobby Moon, Bobby B. <laughs> Many announcements. Let's see, first announcement. The unknown bass player actually couldn't get in the park. <laughs> Name was not on the list. It's got to look under the year. And I'm not going to. I'm not going to tell his name. I achieved my destiny. I don't want to ruin it for him. Had to sneak in. You know, actually, Mary Jo was able to get him in. <laughs> get your team out. <laughs> Mary Jo Lee's on the guitar. I only go through this one. On the other guitar with the best album that come out in 50 years. Just come out a couple weeks ago. Her name is Suzanne Thomas. I'm going to have her do a song for that. I'm going to do it in honor of the person that this festival is dedicated to. And I've been asked several times to say something about this. And I've thought about it. I had too much to say. So I like uh, just as the festival goes on, each time we're on stage, I like to share some information that came my way during the years uh, with regards to Fuzzy. And I was going to say Fuzzy's name, but you know, I think everybody just knows exactly who I'm talking about. Stand down there in the dust every year. And... Uh, You might not know this. Uh, when Fuzzy passed away, he left a will, leaving everything he had, which was a lot more than people might have suspected, to the Winter Hawk Bluegrass Festival. <laughs> and uh, so it's good to know that a festival could have been an important part of his life. Because he was an important part of our life. And I'd just like to tell you one thing that happened, uh, I believe it was the second or third year we ever had this festival. And I, I come around a corner and he wasn't just exactly there. And uh, he'd been off in the woods conducting some business. And I, I just had sat there at the corner because I was like, wait a minute, the festival can't be going on if Fuzzy's not here at the corner. And, Pretty soon he come around, oh, sorry I missed you. And I said, man, and we had never talked before. I mean, we'd wave and howdy and all that, you know. And I said, it just blew me away. I had to sit here in the park. And he come up and he shook my hand. He says, well, now I feel like somebody important that you stop and talk to. Me. And I went up a hill and I thought, wait a minute. I feel like somebody important because Fuzzy stopped and talked to me. And that's basically what he did. He just stopped and talked to us. And I think this song from Suzanne's latest album kind of fits that.
said, do this song, because if we did it some other time, he wouldn't be here. Okay. And that's better than the other way around, which is, I'm going to be here now, don't do that song. <laughs> down. down south in New Orleans, prettiest girls I've ever seen. Sparkling eyes look so sweet. We make love to the Cajun beach. Ships and anchor my suitcase. 